Parg BI incremental refresh made simple. Wonderful, nobody's left the room. Once I did a session, half the audience left. So this gives me ins inspiration and confidence. Right, there are certain technologies I both love and hate. Transactional replication, the apply word in T-SQL, or Windows functions. It took me a long time to learn those technologies. And now I'm able to use them, they are just amazing. Today's session, I want to give you a kit to take away. A Lego kit, if you like. I'm going to give you all the codes. I'm going to give you the presentation. I'm even going to give you documentation and links. Now, I don't think I've switched on the mic. Is the mic on? Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you. I can't hear myself. It's quite weird. Right. I've moved on a slide without realizing. Brilliant. Now. I am relatively intelligent, I hope. I've got a degree. And the first thing I did when I looked at incremental refresh is I went and found the documentation. Then I read the documentation, and then I read the documentation again. And then I read the documentation a third time, fourth time, fifth time. And every time I read the documentation, I felt somewhat discombobulated. It's a wonderful word, and I'm going to say it again. Discombobulated. Some of you in the room are saying, what does that mean? Discombobulated means alarmed and confused. I was alarmed because I could speak and read English. It's my first language. But I couldn't understand the documentation. No matter how many times I read it, I was like, what does this mean? Surely someone like myself should be able to understand it. And hopefully you are that, maybe you are in the same position. Thinking, how does incremental refresh work? In which case you're in the right room. What I decided to do, I'm a scientist. I trained as a scientist. So when I was at university, I said, do an experiment. If you do this over here, what happens over there? If you do that over there, what happens over here? So I did an experiment. If you want to follow on with that experiment or do the same experiment, there are some minimum requirements. I'm sorry. You can't do this with Power BI free. It's just not going to work. You need at least Power BI Pro. I use premium per user. If you have premium per capacity, fantastic. You can do everything I'm going to show you today. I'm going to make a big mistake here, and then I'm going to correct it. I'm going to assume that you know these three things. If you don't, don't worry. Now, you all have phones with a camera on. I'd like you to take out your phones and take a picture of this slide, and I'll explain why. This is the QR code and the bit.ly link to the GitHub repository where you'll find the codes, the documentation, the, the presentation, and some other links, and also the video for what I'm going to talk about. Sorry, a video to explain some things. I'm not the slightest bit nervous looking out at this audience and seeing some of the people who are here. In fact, seeing everybody. The fact you came to this session is wonderful. What am I going to talk about? First thing I'm going to talk about is why. Why should you even bother learning incremental refresh? Why should you look into this feature? Number two, the rolling window. The rolling window is a very important concept in Power BI. If you don't know what it is, I'm going to explain it with some nice diagrams, because that's how I understand it. Number three, I like to introduce people to other people. And I'm going to introduce you to the data that I use for this experiment. It's very simple. There's two tables. It had to be simple for me because I needed something simple to understand. Number four, you'll be glad to know this bit, we're gonna build some things. I'm gonna show you some screenshots of how I build incremental refresh. Okay, that's the longest part of this session. If we are very lucky, there is a bonus section with a little bit of additional content for you to explore. Something I think you should be aware of if you haven't come across it, which you may have. If you have any questions, if you can keep them until the end, I may run out of time. I don't know. I like to talk a lot. 
or I will be in the community corner. My contact details will be up there. These are my contact details. I love talking about Power BI. I love talking about data. Yes, I am the twit with a cravat. On a Friday, I tweet out the dress up picture. Fantastic, dress up Friday picture. As you can see, I'm dressed up in a kilt today just to make a little bit of difference because I spend the rest of the week in jeans and t-shirt. I have the pleasure of working with a delightful company in Edinburgh called Corum. There we go, I'm losing the mic. Which is based in sunny Edinburgh. Some people might think it's a bit strange. And these are my contact details. Right, I work with a data team. We do lots of things with data, but you're not here for an advert for my company. The one thing I will ask you to do is go and say thank you to the sponsors. The sponsors are one of the things that make this conference possible for me even to speak to you today. Let's get started. Okay, first topic, why? Why should you bother to learn about incremental refresh? I'm going to give you three reasons. You might have other ones. These are three that I picked out. The first one is lower refresh times. Okay, so you may have the most amazing database. My client's got a wonderful database. He's 50, 60 gigabytes in size. It takes hours to get it into the Power BI service and only a small section of the data changes. But you have to reload it every single time by default. Incremental refresh will allow you to select the data to refresh. So therefore quicker refresh times. More reliable queries. If anyone's ever worked with SQL Server or other large database platforms, your queries, unfortunately, the larger they get, the, more, the greater the chance they are they're gonna fall over and go splat. That means you have to rerun them. Smaller queries, faster times, less hassle from your help desk, less hassle from your clients, more time for your hot beverage that you really like, and more time to innovate. Less resource consumption. You can do more with less. Because you're refreshing less data, you can do more with that. Okay, so I was very confident. I thought, well, I now know enough about incremental refresh to go and set it up. So I went and asked my customer two questions. The first question was, how much data do you want to store? Okay, now, if your customers are like mine, then what they're gonna to say to you is everything forever, right? inconceivable and I go back and say yes you can have that but here's the bill and they go okay then we're going to compromise okay and my customer decided to compromise said two years two years worth of data we're going to load in to the data set and that's the example I'm going to use incremental refresh also has this idea of an update so the data you can select a small selection of data small part of the data is refreshed every time it runs. And I said to the customer, how often does the data change? Well, they said, once the data loads in, 14 days. It might delete records, might adjust, and might change. That's what they told me. Find out that wasn't right later on. So we now have the business requirements, keep two years worth of data, and the last 14 days refresh every time. Okay. So I decided, right, I'm going to go into the data flow and I'm going to set up incremental refresh. And I opened it up and I read this. I made a mistake of trying to show this to a customer in a training session. And he said, what does that mean? And I went, well, um, uh, because this is how I felt when I first read that. Which also leads me very nicely to the second topic that I'm going to try and talk about today. This is the rolling window. Okay, the rolling window, I want to demonstrate using the data duckies. Data duckies are with me today, okay? So, I'm going to show you some diagrams. So the first diagram I'm going to base on this, okay? So we're going to load some data into a data flow or data set on the 1st of January, 2023, and I'm going to apply incremental refresh, and it looks a bit like this. Okay, so data ducky number one represents the 1st of January 2021. Data ducky number two 
represents the 1st of January 2023. So what we have between the two data duckies is two years worth of data. Okay. Data ducky number three, who's very excited to join in, represents the 18th of December 2022. Because what we take is today's date, when we run the refresh and we go back 14 days, takes us back to the 18th of December 2022. Great, so we'll set it up. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to run incremental refresh until the 8th of January 2023. Okay. We're not going to apply it on that day. We're just going to wait until that day and suddenly we'll look at it. What does it look like? Well, it looks like this. So, data ducky number one has moved from the 1st of January to the 8th of January 2021. Data ducky number two, who's about to fall off the desk, is now the 8th of January 2023. And data ducky number three, who's always very excited, has now moved to the 25th of December 2022. We still have two years worth of data, but some things have happened. Now, when I first saw that, I went, meh. Why should I care? Well, let me explain what couple of reasons why you should care. If you look at the diagram, compare the 1st of January compared to the 8th of January, the incremental refresh window has moved on. Remember I talked about the rolling refresh? It moves on every single day. So data on the 18th of December 2022 is no longer being refreshed. What's even worse is that any data or any records between the 1st of January 2021 and the 7th of January 2021 is gone. It is deleted, it is removed, you can no longer access it. So the rolling window is moving forward a day at a time. We'll look at that a bit more later on. Okay, number three. I said we've done an experiment, so I want to introduce you to the data. I had the pleasure of working both as a call center agent. Hello, my name's Robert, can I help you? And also doing reporting for call centers. So I decided to use some data that represented a call center. Two tables, the agent just contains agents. Three agents, needs to be simple for me, okay? One to many relationship with the fact table. Now the data for the fact table, the lowest level of granularity or detail is per day the number of calls missed, answered, or forwarded per day. It is a date-time value. You've spotted that already. I can see that in your eyes. He's trying to fool us. You could use a date value, but actually Microsoft say you have to use a date-time, and I'll show you how we're going to use that later. Now, I set up an empty SQL database because that's what I can do. I have access to facilities. You could use an Oracle database, a Postgres database. It doesn't matter. As long as you can get into Power BI, you are good. Then I ran this script. I'm not going to show you all the T-SQL because it's boring and dull. You've got access to the code, so you can go home and run this yourself. This creates the empty fact table. Just contains a shell. Next one oh, creates the agent table with all the data. And then finally, this one just generates some random data for the fact table, takes today's date when it runs, and generates six months worth of random data. Brilliant. If you go into the SQL Server Management Studio and run these queries, this is what you get back. Isn't that exciting? No. This is what I'm going to use to set up my experiments. Experiments are boring, but they are necessary, okay? That's why I learned as a scientist. You've got to set up everything to make sure your environment's the way you want it to. The next thing I did is I set up this environment, okay? This is what I use when I set up. This is for the premium version. You've got premium per capacity or premium per user license. This is the architecture I used. You may recognize it, you may not. Anything to the right-hand side of the blue dotted line is Power BI service. We've got a data source on the left, SQL Server database, and I set up a workspace. I like my naming conventions. So that workspace incremental refresh DF, DF is where I keep my data flow. So I create a data flow in a, data, in a workspace. It takes data from the SQL Server database. That's all it does, nothing exciting. Next one I set up is another workspace, incremental refresh DS. I didn't say my experiments were exciting. I just thought they were necessary. So this may be new to some people. 
the data source for the data set is the data flow. Okay? And last but not least, I've got a third workspace, and some people are thinking, oh my God, he's mad. There are good reasons why I do this. I don't have time to explain it here. See me in the community corner. The last workspace just contains thin reports. The data source for the thin report is the data set. You want to know more, ask me in the community corner. Okay, if you've only got Power BI Pro, don't use a data flow. You cannot use uh, data flows in part, and if your workspace is backed by a Pro license, you cannot set up incremental refresh and data flows, and I should have rehearsed that much more. Right, if you're wondering how to do that, there is a video in the GitHub repository. Okay, we'll take you through it, or a link to the uh, web posting site where I've got it. <gasps> Deep breath, finally. We're going to start building some stuff. Yes! I know it's not very exciting, but it helped me to understand incremental refresh. So, this is what we're going to do first. I'm excited at this point. It's like, oh, I'm going to start playing with incremental refresh. So I've set up my data flow. It's connected to the data source, which is an Azure SQL database in this example. You go in and you click on the edit button and then you find that the incremental refresh button is subtly hidden on the right hand side. Okay, I've made it nice and big and pointed it out because it wasn't obvious to me when I first went looking for it. Okay, right, by default it's switched off. You make the slider and you switch it on. Okay, so when you, when you switch it on, you get all these controls suddenly become live. And you're probably wondering at this point, what the heck does any of this mean? Right, choose a date time column to filter by. Why? You're gonna use a date time column to determine how much data you want to store in the data flow. We're gonna use call date because that's the record that determines when that value is added to the fact table. Okay, next thing we're going to do, rows from the past. I love this wording, it's great. What does that mean? How much time do you want, how much data do you want to store between data ducky number one and data ducky number two? Two years, pull down lists, select years, put in two. I know this is not exciting, okay? I understand that, right? Refresh rows from the past. This is my incremental refresh window. We've already got the business requirement, says 14 days. Select days and pop in 14. Wonderful. So now I know I'm going to store two years worth of data and refresh the last 14. Before you move on, think about this. The 14 days you're going to refresh are going to be reloaded every single time you run incremental refresh. So your business might be saying, we need 10 years refreshed. Go back to them and say, well, that's gonna take X amount of time. Can I get it done in the time I've been given to refresh every single data set in the entire service? Or do you have to compromise? This is very important. This is what's gonna save you time. This is what's gonna make you look good, but it takes negotiation between you and the business or your client. This is why we get paid the big bucks, I hope. Right, so, bottom right hand side, click on save. We're almost there, we're almost onto another topic. And it says, once it's changed, save the change, it says refresh now. I always say refresh now, okay? My guess is what happens in the background is incremental refresh is set on the data set and they sprinkle some magic fairy dust, Microsoft fairy dust, and sets up the incremental refresh. So some things happen in the background which you can go and explore. Don't have time to go into it. So we hit refresh now, incremental refresh is set up, and we're ready to move on to the next topic. Isn't this exciting? I understand that, okay? We will get to a point where we get some more exciting stuff. This is where it gets a bit confusing because you've got to open up a Power BI desktop report builder. Sorry, what? Yeah, this is how you set up your data set. It may change in the future. This recording might be out of date. Thank you. 
Okay, so we open it up. First thing I do when I'm creating a data set is I save the file. I give it a name. I also put DS at the end. The reason for that is when I'm looking at where I keep all my files locally, I know when I look at the Power BI desktop report files, DS means it's a data set. It only contains DAX or the data model or what I need to set up that data set. The data, sorry. You think I'd actually rehearse this? You think I should be good at this by now? So, the data source for the data set is going to be the data flow. Data this, data that. That's our talk for today. We're going to talk about data. So, the data source for the data set is a data flow. Go to get data, select data flows. When it opens up, I love this. Select, works, double check. Workspaces, okay? That will list all the workspaces in the Power BI service where you have data flows that you have access to. Okay? What I've done, I've set up one there already. Incremental refresh, DF, I go in there. Now when I find the work, the, sorry, the, the data flow, this is exciting. When I find the data flow, I can select the tables. There may be 20 tables in there, maybe 10 tables. You can pick as many as you want. That's a hint for why I set up the workspaces. See me at the community corner. So I'm going to select two tables from the data flow. Dim agents and fact calls handled. Okay. And then I'm going to click on the transform data button. Why? This. This is direct from the Microsoft documentation. This is what you have to do. Hopefully you all feel comfortable setting up parameters. Parameters are wonderful. I love parameters. Parameters are amazing. I don't have time to talk about them, but you pop them in and yes, they must be spelt this way and it is case sensitive. Go and ask Microsoft why, I don't know. There are a lot of questions I like to ask Microsoft. A lot. So, I pop in. I also add a date time value to the parameters. Why are you doing that, Robert? Well, that's a very good question. I'm very glad that you're switched on asking that question. So the first one, the range start, I set the 9th of January, 2023, and the 16th of January, 2023. So, what on earth are you doing? Why are you setting such a small date window? You've got six months worth of data in there, generating a database. Why are you loading that small bit? He's daft. I made this mistake. I went and loaded all the data from uh, the fact table into Power BI Desktop and wondered why it took so long to publish to the service. So what you're going to do is take a slice of the cake, a small section, it's sample data. It's not the entire fact table. Yes, you're asking me why am I going to upload a sample? I'm going to answer that in a minute. Okay, so we're going to upload a small sample of the data, just a flavor for Power BI to work on. So, exciting bit again. We're going to add a filter to the call date, because the call date is what we're going to use to filter and set up the incremental refresh. Click on call date, click on time, fil time date, date, time filters, click on custom filter. I like using the GUI. So what I do is I pop in from the pull down list, you select is after or equal to, because I can never remember. I have to go to back to this documentation to remember, and I set it up so the, it's going to use the parameter range start. This is dull, okay? I accept that, but I'm going through it step by step. There's nothing up my sleeves, I'm not hiding anything. Next one we need to do is add another filter, okay? is before range end. And this is what your filter row should look like. I can see the excitement in your eyes. Please, Robert, let me go and do this right now. <laughs> this is not exciting, I know that. But I want to take you through this step by step. So we click on OK, and we're going to filter the data. Yes, we've got some data into Power BI Desktop. Finally, we've got some data. It's taken me goodness knows how long to get to this point. Take me a while. I've got the filter rows and I click on close and apply and I exit out Power BI Query Editor. Whiz, whiz, whiz. And we're back into Power BI Desktop. Yes. Finally back where I feel comfortable. 
I go into the fields well, left hand mouse click on the table name, and I get a context menu, I select incremental refresh. Okay, by default it's switched off, always is, that's the default state. Now, we get this. I imagine the Microsoft Christmas party, the data flow team over here, and the data set Power BI desktop team over here, and they don't talk to each other. So the message you get is different from the one in the data flow. Thank you, Microsoft, you're wonderful. So archive data starting before the refresh date is how much data between ducky, data ducky number one and data ducky number two, which is two years. Okay, so pull down list, years, pop in number two. Are you getting the pattern? It's really quite simple. Once you've got the, your eye in, as he say, once you know what to look for, it's quite simple. Repeating it is boring, I understand that. The next one, incrementally refresh data between starting after, what does it say? Blah, blah, blah. You can read it as well as I can for the refresh date. This is between data ducky number two and data ducky number three. How many days do we want to incrementally refresh? Why did Microsoft not do this the same? I wish I knew, but they didn't. So days, so with two years worth of data, we're going to store, 14 days we're going to refresh each time we do the incremental refresh. Click on apply, this is exciting. No, it's not. We click on publish and we're going to publish it to the service. Yay! We're almost there, almost there. And of course, because I've got my naming convention, I know which workspace I'm going to publish into. Incremental refresh, DS for data set. Just makes my life easy. Okay, because I'll, I'll do something silly. Yeah, I've published into the data flow workspace before, yes. Whiz, whiz, whiz. And it's up. Oh, brilliant. The next thing you do, and I recommend to my customers, you go into the Power BI service, you find the workspace where you're just published the data set to. Now, you hit on the refresh now button. Why? Because we've just uploaded the data set with a small slice of the data. It's not two years, it's a small section we've uploaded. So we need to get the data set to go out to the data source and pull in all the data. And at the same time, if we get there, they sprinkle some magic Microsoft fairy dust that sets up incremental refresh. There's something interesting happens in the background. If I got time, I'll talk to you a little bit about it. So we hit refresh, boom, it's done. So we've got incremental refresh set up in the data flow and the data set. One more step, I promise. One more step. We're gonna set up a thin report, okay? The thin report just contains visualizations, and nothing else. It is so warm up here. Are you feeling warm as well? Oh my goodness me, so much excitement for me. Right, so empty Power BI desktop report. I save it, I give it a name. Incremental refresh, RPT, so I know it's a report. Only contains visualizations. Oh, amazing. We do what we did before, get data. Where are we getting the data from? We're getting it from the data set. Click on Power BI data sets, and you've done this before. You all know this, I know you do, it's wonderful. Data Hub, pick the data set I've just uploaded and click Select Connect. This continues to blow my mind. I'm now connected to a live instance of SQL Server Analysis Services tabular model running in the clouds. If that doesn't blow your mind, come and see me and I'll tell you why, that's amazing. But it does, there's no data stored in this file. Last thing we do is we publish to the service and we save it into the workspace, and guess what I didn't do? I didn't do a slide for that. Because the other way you can do it is go to the GitHub repository and download the one I've already created. So you open it up. First thing it'll say is unable to connect. Click on edit. You've done this before, you know this. This is great. Find the data set that you've just created and you get this. My goodness, you lot are patient. Coming this far with me because now we're going to start to do some exciting things. So, sorry, I've now got the totals for each agent. 
This is coming straight from the SQL Server database into the data flow and into the data set. And now see what's in there, a nice summary. So let's go to the SQL Server database and there's a script called confirm totals. All it does is give you the total number of values, so not total number of, however you are, put my teeth in, gives you the total number of answered, missed, forwarded calls for each agent summarized. Let's see if it matches the Power BI report. Oh my goodness, it does. It's as if I've rehearsed this. I know, it's a bad joke, I accept that. Finally though, we can now start the experiment. But that was good practice for when you have to set up incremental refresh. So, I'm not gonna show you the T-SQL code, it's all in the GitHub repository, I'm just gonna use this to describe what I did. So the first thing I wanted to do was add records to the data set in the SQL Server database. Okay, this is exciting, isn't it? This is where it gets interesting. So I'm going to insert records, and I'm going to add three records. So the calls answered 100, calls forwarded 100, calls missed 100. You can read that as well as I can. So I run it in the SQL Server database. Then I refresh the data flow to pull the data from SQL Server into the Power BI service and I refresh the data set. Here's the before and after. It's amazing. Suddenly records are appearing. It's gone from a data source, so that could be records that have been inserted by an automated process. It's come into Power BI, but I've only refreshed what has changed. Remember, it's the last 14 days. Anything in the last 14 days is all that I pick up. So what I've done is I've inserted records into the incrementally refreshed window between data ducky number two and data ducky number three. Okay, so I've inserted records. And I thought, let's see if Microsoft are clever. Wasn't quite sure what they did or they didn't do. So this one there, I found the last date in the data set, sorry, that's data ducky number two, which is the 1st of January, 2023. And I'm going to update values where the call date is equal to the first the last date in the data set, and I'm going to do these. So I've inserted records. I'm now going to edit or update some records. Run the script in the database, refresh the data flow, refresh the data set. Did that go forward? Yes, it did. There we go, I forgot that. And it does it. You can check this for yourself. You've got the scripts to run it. So. What did I do? I updated data, whoops, is he? I'm falling over, whoops, where the data's inside the incrementally refresh window. There's a reason why I'm repeating that. Hopefully you get the hint. If you don't, I'll explain it later again. The last date in the data set, I'm going to delete records. So I've inserted, I've updated, and now I'm going to delete records in the incremental refresh window and see what happens. So I run the script, refresh the data flow, refresh the data set, and the changes are picked up. Now, at that point, I was very excited. I know I can insert records, I know I can edit records, I know I can delete records, as long as the call date in this case was in the incremental refresh window, it will pick them up because it reloads all the data every single time incremental refresh runs. That's wrong, oh dear. I make mistakes, there we go, I'm not perfect, right. So the last one is slightly different. So before, we've updated data in the incremental refresh window. We're now going to try and delete a record down beside data ducky number one, the 1st of January, 2021. Now you remember from the diagram before, in here, this section here is the archived data. It doesn't change. So, predict what's going to happen. I'm going to delete all the records where the call date is equal to the 1st of January, 2021. Run the script in the database, refresh the data flow, refresh the data set. Nothing, nothing happens because any data in the archive data window does not change once it's been loaded. That's it, it's fixed. 
that you're all really disappointed at that point. You're like, this is no good. Because yeah, we tried to delete records from here in the archive data window, but we couldn't. So, but I knew about something called slowly changing dimensions. Because my data architect says, we've got, we've got slowly changing dimensions. And I thought, I'll look at it and I'll say, well, is there a way of accommodating slowly changing dimensions? In the data set, in the, the table, you'll notice there's an adjusted date. The adjusted date when you first set it up is set to null. There's no value in it. So this script will set the adjusted date to be the call date for every single record. Yeah, so, and Robert, why should I care? Well, it's quite interesting. So let me update the values. That's good, I haven't finished yet. What you need to do is up recreate your data set and data flow, because you made that change, you need to reset it, go through all those steps. However, this time I want you to click on the detect data changes. And detect data changes, you pick the adjusted date, and I love the wording. If the refresh data, if the, only the re, only, I think it's only if the, ref, the, if the maximum value in this column changes. So if the value of the adjusted date changes, it will pick up the changes for that record. Now you're probably looking at me going like, what? what? This is the reason why I did the experiment. I wanted to see what happened when I did this. So I've now set up for the last two years, refreshing the last 14 days based on call date, I've take, detect data change. So let's try something. So you've got to, so got to do for the data set, apologies. Same for the data set, adjusted date, detect data changes. I ran this code. So data ducky number one represents the 1st of January 2021. The 1st of January 2021 is in the incremental, sorry, the archive data window. I'm going to update records where the call date is equal to the first date, the 1st of January 2021, and I'm going to set the adjusted date equal to today's date, which is the, oh my God, 17th of March 2023. So the adjusted date for those records where I'm doing the update is going to be the 17th of March 2023. Actually, no, that's not quite right. It should be the 1st of January 2023. I apologize. Need to adjust my slides. So we refresh the data set, refresh the data flow. Okay. But it picks up the changes. Does this make sense? Possibly not. Maybe it does. I was confused until I thought about the diagram. Because the way it's worded is even though the call date for the records that we selected was the first data ducky number one, which was the 1st of January 2021, the adjusted date would actually have been technically the 1st of January 2023. So the adjusted date fell within the incremental refresh window, so therefore it picked up the changes just for those records. Okay, I encourage you to do the experiment at home. Only by doing this for myself and seeing it, seeing the changes in the SQL Server database, looking at, SQL, looking at the Power BI data flow and data set, confirming it for myself helped me to understand it. That's why I'm giving away all the code, the documentation today so that you can do it as well. Because I'm probably doing maybe an okay job of explaining that, who knows? Now, going back to the customer that said, oh yeah, I've only got, we only change records for 14 days and after that it's fixed. No, as you know with any client, you peel off the onion and suddenly it's, well, actually, um, but okay. And the enterprise architect said to me, oh yeah, we need to delete records occasionally. I was like, pardon? Okay, as you wish, we'll make it happen. I'm going to show you a pattern that Patrick LeBlanc of Gynacube showed, and a few other people. It's a soft delete, very simple. So how do we do it? What we do is we add another column to the fact table. Okay. 
If you don't know a SQL DBA or you don't know a DBA, go and find a DBA. DBAs are really useful sort of stuff if you don't want to write it yourself. They're really good. They do this sort of stuff really easily. If I did a column called is deleted to the fact table, it's a bit type. So it's basically on or off. I've set the value to false. Then I go into the data flow. I find a new column. I set a logical filter and I say, where the value equals false, where is deleted equals false, only return those records. So every single record, the entire fact table is currently set to false. So it'll return every single record. You need to do the same for the data set. Should have told you there's a lot of repeating in this session. Okay, set it to false. And I'm gonna run this script. So again, I'm going to find values where the call date is equal to the first date, 1st of January 2021. I'm going to update records where the call date is equal to the 1st of January 2021, and I'm going to update the adjusted date to the 1st of January 2023. However, I'm going to set the value of is deleted is to true just for those records which are in the archive data window. But I've also set the, up, the um, adjusted date. Hopefully you're with me on this one. Okay, brilliant. So I refresh the data flow, refresh the data set, and they're deleted. A soft delete, you could actually reverse that. Yes, it's more painful. Yes, it's more hassle. However, it means that you're doing it just in Power BI, okay? It's all handled in Power BI, so if you undelete it, they will suddenly appear. Okay. Oh, I have lots of time. My goodness, I must have done something wrong. Bonus section. Is there more? Hopefully you want a little bit more, because if you can set this up, there are some other things to be aware of. Now, I am not a car mechanic. I really don't care about cars. My late father-in-law loved cars, because he used to take engines apart, he used to have a great time. Every time he got a new car, he'd be up, oh, can you just pop up the, the bonnet open, Robert, so I can have a look. And he loved looking. I don't care. I say, Mr. Mechanic, go and fix it. But, I do love looking at technology and computers. And I can't resist a poke under the hood to see what's there to find out. And I want to share something with you. It does require the XML endpoint. Now, if any Melissa is too knee deep in tech, Alexander Arverson did this session, uh, talked about the XML endpoint and it blew my mind. Up until that point, I was like, yeah, who cares? He explained why you should care about the XML endpoint. I don't have time to talk about it. However, you need to be able to have, you need to have an XML endpoint exposed in order to see this. Right. If you have a data set in a workspace that is backed by either premium per user or premium per capacity, and you look at the settings, you will find a connection string. Yeah. Are you excited yet? No, obviously not. We're gonna take that connection string and we're gonna copy it into clipboard. I can use clipboard, I'm pretty good. Then I go into SQL Server Management Studio. I, I've used SQL Server Management Studio for a long time. Usually I connect to databases, okay? This time I'm gonna to connect to Analysis Services instance. Ooh. So I pop in the connection string and I use Azure Active Directory to connect to that analysis services instance. Now, if you know what's coming next, it's exciting, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, so what? You're like, I can now see the tables in my data set. That's really interesting, Robert. I could do that as well. And then I went and looked a bit further because this particular one, I've just uploaded the data set before I run incremental refresh because I want to have a quick look. And I go to the table and I click on the right hand mouse click and I click on partitions. Then I see this. So what, Robert? There's only 21 rows. We know that because when we upload the data set for the incremental refresh, you only upload a small section. 
you're not showing me anything exciting. That's very true. So what I did is I disconnected, refreshed the data set in the service, then I went back in and found this. You're all going, so what? These partitions allow you to do a heck of a lot more than you can do an incremental refresh in the service using the GUI. There is so much more to discover. I recommend going and finding out. Uh, Patrick LeBlanc talks about, a little bit about this. There's a couple of people that have got some videos on it. Go and explore partitions and SQL Server analysis services. This is worthwhile looking at, I promise you. I wish I could run, roll back time. This is a bit.ly link and the QR code to the GitHub repository. This is where you'll find all the codes. This is where you'll find documentation and links to uh, posts on incremental refresh. This is where you'll find the video. This is where you'll find all the information I've managed to gather from out there about incremental refresh, including a copy of this presentation. As soon as I finish, I will upload it as soon as I finish this session. Now, this is not a perfect presentation by any stretch of the imagination. I, as a speaker, want your feedback. If you thought it was poor, if you thought it was fair, if you thought it was good, rate me, tell me. What I would really, really like is you tell me why. Usually, like you, even if the feedback sounds like too many slides, meh. Hey, we can always talk about that. Please go and speak to the sponsors. I know it's boring. I know you don't necessarily want to speak to them. I went and spoke to a sponsor out there, which resulted in saving about 70% of our time in a process that costs us a lot of time, just by having a chat to the sponsor. Maybe some of you might be looking for another role. I know of at least two people that on the, C the B SQL Buddies who found new jobs accidentally. I found a job just for, because I happened to chat to someone at a conference like this. Even if you just pop over and say, thank you so much for sponsoring SQL Bits, would you like to scan my badge? If you happen to unsubscribe next week, I don't know about it. SQL Bits committee don't know, it's entirely up to you. Data duckies are awesome. These are my contact details. Before I finish up, just I want to double check, does anybody have any questions they are just itching to answer right, or be answered right now? We have no online questions, so I've really done a really, really, oh, one, oh, two questions, one question. What's here? Yeah, so, uh, what is your problem? Yeah, so what if you um, make uh, changes to the report and then you publish, do you always have to make a full load in the Power BI service? Because uh, if it takes, let's say it takes an hour to refresh, then uh, you'll have uh, an hour delay that the report is not available. If you're adding new, so if you're adding new fields to the data set? Let's say you're making uh, changes to the visuals. Oh, if you're making changes to the visuals, you're making no changes to the underlying to structure? To the data set, yeah. Uh, but That's it, fine. Because the way I, the way I construct it is because you're a thin report, it's only the thin report you're changing, you're not making any changes to the structure of the data set, in which case you're fine. It doesn't affect it. That's okay. one of the reasons why I suggest that architecture. Okay, uh, and then if you're adding fields, you'll have to do that. Your friend is partitions. I don't have time to go into all the details, but look at partitions. Partitions will actually allow you to refresh the data in a way that's more efficient and faster. I, I, I think I've got one minute, 30 seconds. I couldn't explain it all. And we've got another question on the screen. Why have both data flow and data set? We load it, load it twice. Yeah, agreed. I don't have time to go into all the discussions as to why. I would go back to a session I do when I talk to my customers. I talk about the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. Come and speak to me in the community corner. If that person is watching online, send me an email. We can talk about it. There's a very good reason why I do that. Yes, I am repeating it but I wanted to show you both data flows and data sets. I've got 54 seconds left. These are my contact details. I love talking about Power BI, believe it or not. Have an amazing SQL Bits. Have an amazing rest of the day. It's been an absolute pleasure and delight. Hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And I've been Robert French. Thank you very much.